Yo, 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 JS Camp. Hi. So I, I call this talk prototyping, and I just want to say really quick. So uh, back in the day, I said flaw, I said pong, uh, I, I say spa, I say poire. So if you hear me say it today, because everyone around me goes, hey, stop saying poire, but my favorite part about the word poire, other than I've historically, you know, said these same words, is I get to go poire. So anyway. So today we're talking about high fidelity prototypes surpassing the uncanny valley. And kind of what I mean is um, you can make prototypes and you put them on a mobile device and you show them to a client. And sometimes there's little giveaways. And the giveaways break uh, the immersion. And that's what I mean by the uncanny valley. And we are going to do our best to create a web application that's page-based. So we're going to basically use Jamstack to make pages, load those on a mobile device using PWA technology, <laughs> PWA technology, right? And uh, when you experience it and you launch it from your home screen, you can fool most people that you've built a native app. So hopefully that sounds exciting, because uh, that's what we're going to do. Our target user experience. We want a mobile or a desktop PWA. Oh, man, am I going to switch now? I don't know. Who cares? We got a mobile and desktop PWA. We're going to launch from the coveted system drawer, right? Oh, whoa, it's on my home screen. That means it's so much more official than a URL. And we're going to load instant and full screen because I think the, the uncanny valley even begins when you launch it. If you launch it and the icon's kind of whack or you launch it and the splash screen doesn't show up, you're immediately like, mm, something's wrong. I don't quite know what it is. So we're going to make sure that those are present. We're going to load uh, instant, and we're going to have a seamless demo flow. So we're not building a production application, though a lot of these techniques are super uh, valid in that way. But we are going to build a flow that can go get you. Um, you could go user test. You could get funding, or you could sell a client. So I come from the agency world. I've built many, many prototypes. I find being able to build prototypes that are of high fidelity very powerful. I think a UX engineer holds all of the tools and all of the opportunity to really sell people, from designers to developers to managers to everybody. Uh, and so a UX flow is worth 1,000 words, and a prototype is worth 1,000 meetings. So I'm going to try to help you build something that can save you 1,000 words in meetings. I hope that sounds interesting. And how are we going to do it? We're going to use a manifest, right? That's how pause begin. We're going to make a, as much as possible static and then we're going to use the web. The web has tons of rad stuff in it, and we're going to just optimize as much as we can. And the crucial, the crucial mm, like performance thing we're going for is optimizing for first paint. And I don't mean like watercolors, you know, like I mean like the browser painting the stuff it downloaded. And we're going to everything that we're doing today is so that that first paint is happening within like 30 milliseconds, and sometimes faster. And it's going to be so fast that the browser is going to blow away a page and paint a new one faster than a single page app might do it. Right? Oh, what? What? Oh, how? Oh, shocking. So, proof, and I want you all to try it. Take a minute, go to the URL, coinsafe.netlify.com, if you want to see this prototype, add it to your home screen, uh, or you can just watch my demo here, and you can see this is running on an iPhone 10 simulator. See, I just clicked the link. That was a new page. That buy button, new page. This slider, it's just a native slider. Hit the button. It's a new page. The URL is going to be Ethereum slash buy. This is Ethereum slash review. We're going to buy it. We're going to go back to the home screen. Boom. I just sold a client that I can make an Ethereum-based coin, uh, a Bitcoin application, and I can go get maybe a couple million dollars if I'm really clever. Um, and I've used this technique, like I said, to fool many people into thinking that I've built something much more official than I have, and it has given me a lot of power, and I want to give you power. Anyway. So we're going to do that. We're going to rewind. We saw the demo. Uh, hopefully, you've tried it on your phone. Add it to your home screen. Launch it and be like, oh, yeah, OK, I guess it's fine. And, uh, but we're going to unpack that line by line and how I got there. And we're going to start with the manifest. This is the PWA entry point. So this is how you make one. In your HTML, you go, boop, here's my manifest. I'd like you to load that, please, browser. And inside of that, you get to specify your app name and your short name. So this is the name that's going to show up on the home screen. And this is an important part of your brand. This is where you're, anyway, this is pretty obvious what this one's doing. Not that crazy. It's used on the device home screen. I like to also have this match the title in my HTML. Oh, that's optional. 
Then we can set a theme. And this is where stuff gets really fun for designers and other folks, where you're like, ooh, theme color, that's cool. And CoinSafe uses white for the theme color and white for the background color. This is kind of cool, too. I think there's it's the next one. Oh, no. Oh, we'll go into meta later. But the app theme is really nice on Android. You can see these colors reflected in Chrome's top nav. Uh, that's why I call them OS tints down there. You get to give hints to the uh, operating system about how and what kind of colors you want to show up on your application. And we have app icons. These are always really fun. Um, pretty self-explanatory, too. One of the things with a prototype is I like to be really minimal with my icons because these can turn into debt really easy. And so try to find a generator or just manage a small bundle by hand. The code for my prototype is open sourced. I'll release it once I'm done with this talk today. And you can go see how many icons I put in there so that you know, I'm hoping like 80 or 90% of you had a very flawless experience. I didn't build this so that it's flawless across every device. I built this so it's flawless across enough devices for me to go get those goals done, right? I need to get funding, convince someone, show a sweet UX flow, user test or whatever. Um, so the icons, they'll be in my project. You can see how minimal I spent there. And these are Pua Extras. So these are kind of fun additional things you can say. Display standalone is going to launch it into uh, almost full screen. You'll still have the top nav. You can specify full screen, landscape, uh, and then you can do orientation here, portrait and landscape. I chose to lock it into portrait, but my slide framework that this is built on, which will also uh, be open sourced in a couple weeks, will be a Pua as well. So you could add my slides to your home screen and it will support portrait and landscape in full screen. So when you launch it, it'll be uh, really gorgeous, and you can scroll through it, it's really nice. The start URL, this is oddly important, and we're gonna get there later, but this is where if someone hits the icon from your home screen, where do they go? You know, what, where's the start of your application? And I chose slash index.html, so that's the root base of my prototype, and my prototype at index.html is a mock sign-in screen. So when you go to my app, it's gonna launch, and it's gonna say Rambo Gestalt is the user that you're gonna fake log in. Uh, you're not Rambo. I'm not Rambo, uh, but it's a cool name. Uh, anyway, so I like to put uh, like 80s characters in my prototypes. I used to do uh, He-Man and uh, anyway, so that's why Rambo's in there. I just like it. And scope. Scope is something that uh, will be handled more in the future, but this is like if URLs are coming in or if people are clicking things and you are able to handle them. What does it look like for you? So it's pretty nulled right there how I've specified it, but scope is an interesting one. In case you're building a robust production quality application, scope is something you should go check out. After you have specified this manifest JSON and you've said these are all the things that make me happy and I want to be as part of my application, you go to your good old Chrome DevTools, pop them open. There's a manifest uh, area in the Applications tab that you can go review. And Chrome says, hey, we noticed you had a manifest. Uh, is this right? We've, we've scrubbed it all and aggregated it right here. And you can go double check that the browser says, yes, there's no bugs in your JSON. I understand what you want. And you can go verify it here. So there's my app icon. So if you added this to your home screen, you should see that on Android, it's round. And on iOS, it's, of course, a squircle. I love the word squircle. It's just so cool. So on top of the manifest, so this is a complexity issue that we have right now with iOS and Android. Android has like superb support for PWAs and manifest.json, but uh, iOS, it's, it's coming. And so historically, to get there, you used all this metadata. So we're going to go over some of the metadata so that when you added this to your home screen on iOS 12 or 11 or 10 or whatever you're on, you got a similar experience that Android got. And I do that with meta that goes into the head tag of my index.html. And one of the crucial things that you put in there is the viewport tag. And this specifies when this loads up. What do you want the device scale to be? Are things fit in the width? This also unlocks interesting things. Like it removes the 300 millisecond tap delay. Who knew uh, that when you launch a web page, that when you tap anything, there's a 300 millisecond delay? Yeah, that's real. And you can get rid of it. And it's that meta. So the now when someone clicks a link, it's instant. It feels much closer to a native application. You can also use this on your web page so that when someone's just visiting on the web, you get the instant links as well. There used to be JavaScript hacks called Fast Click that would do this. It would watch all your links and instantly invoke them, and it was so cute. Uh, but now we just get to specify some meta, and all the browsers go, oh, this is a mobile-ready page. I'll just go ahead and let those be instant. So here's some of the iOS-specific web application meta that is required. You get to say, I'm a mobile web app capable. Content equals yes, because that makes a lot of sense. But it works, and it's uh, reliable. And then your application name, and you can put your name in there as well. So iOS has additional ways to read uh, meta that's normally, well, that's now in a JSON declaration. This is the sort of legacy way of doing it. 
and you can specify full screen, and um, well, yeah, links need love. We'll get there. So then you also have app theme. So hopefully you're seeing a parallel right now as we're like, oh, this is like all the same stuff that's in manifest JSON. It's just kind of in HTML tags. Uh, we can specify what sort of status bar there is, and there they are. They're kind of cool, right? So you've got um, on top, this is the default. There's a black translucent is in the center, and the one on the bottom, ah, I can't remember what that one is. Anyway, there's only three options. They're not that exciting, but they can be a really nice touch if you're building um, a a prototype that you want to look realistic. This can make your native app look even, or your prototype look even more native because it's got the status bar that's appropriate. So if you launched my prototype from your home screen, you'll notice it boots into the uh, far upper left one, which is, or I think I chose the bottom right one. You know what, I don't remember, it's in the code. I think I chose default, uh, but I have a white application and it helped, um, it's white from the top to the bottom and it looks really seamless on iOS. Then you have brand information. So this is where you specify your icons. And um, this is a minimal amount of icons that I specified here. And then I snuck in an MS application tile image there. So Microsoft Windows 8 came out with support for PWAs a long time ago. And you can pass them your icons so that they can be added to the home screen of the Surface or just any of the Windows 8 uh, home screen items and launch them from that home screen. And that's how you can specify it there. There's additional uh, MS application information that you can send. But I think they've pretty much embraced the manifest JSON at this point. So you kind of get a lot of that for free. But again, you're just getting all your branding information. You're packing these really important uh, brand assets into the HTML so that uh, iOS can pull those down, make them available offline, and when they launch it, it's instant, just like all the other apps. A really quick little note, too, about PWAs and stuff like this is when you add it to your home screen, did you know that Android and iOS actually create a, a native application for you? And they go, and they wrap it, and they put all the icons in there, and they do the work for you. That's what's happening. It's just instead of you running Xcode or you running Android Studio and hitting the button, they do it for you on the fly. So sick. So sick. I love it. OK, so icons. Uh, we, you know, this is our first impression of the application. You can spend a good amount of time here. Don't go too nuts. But if you want, uh, this is a great way to, again, look very official. If your icon looks tight and looks nice and glossy, uh, you can get a lot of really good first impressions. Because if it's not really high quality, that icon, that's another uncanny moment someone has, that there's something maybe a little prototypey feeling here. This is the material design guidelines that they have for how to build an icon. Uh, there's a lot of online websites where you can go past them a high-res asset, and they'll just go poof and create a whole bunch of them for you. You can also use Grunt, and there's other different uh, build tools that will do this for you. So you keep a source file in your, or a source image in your directory as part of your build task. It pumps them out into a directory. You can be good to go. And so here's some of my tips and tricks. Use generator sites. Use build scripts. Uh, be minimal. Your prototype, yeah, this stuff can be baggage really fast, um, really fast. iOS, you need to make a lot of icons and a lot of splash screens. You have to make landscape splash screens and portrait uh, splash screens uh, for all their different sizes. It gets really heavy really quick. On iOS, this, or on Android, the splash screen gets generated for you based on the icon that you pass in. I think that's next. Yeah, splash screens are next. So this is the second impression, right? OK, we've done all this work. We specified our brand. We've got some icons. It's on the home screen. It looks just like everything else. They tapped it. <gasps> the splash screen is coming up. Wow, this is already going so well. Uh, here's some tips and tricks for generating. Um, it's kind of like the image icons. These are really complex. Uh, well, not complex. There's just so many of them. There's just a lot to hold. And so use a generator site or use a build script. You can manage these by hand if you want. I just, I don't know. It gets really tedious, and it can be uh, really annoying. And then on Android, you have your manifest uh, plus icon gets the splash screen gets generated for you. I also think it's uh, conditional. It depends on how long your page takes to load, uh, which is also similar to the other one. But yeah, when you launch from that home screen, uh, you'll get a, the, it'll use the theme color to make a big full background, and it'll take your icon and stick it in the center, and that's it. You'll get a splash screen across every Android device for free. Pretty sweet. The only bummer, you're not in full control. So in case you wanted to do, do something really seamless, like I've done in the past, where we launched a, a splash screen and then um, put a simulated splash screen right behind it. I guess it's behind for y'all right here. And then we've, uh, when the other one faded out, we were in control of the new one. And then we could go, oh, whoosh, right? Or whatever we did that made it look like our splash screen was somehow magically animated. Uh, it was just, you know, we, we tricked you. Ah, the front end is so full of tricks. It's fun. All right. OK, that was just some of the like basic introduction stuff, right? We're just like, ooh, icon, splash screen, no big deal, been there, seen that. But here's where we're going to get into performance optimizations. 
the rest of this talk, we're going to be talking about like prototype specific. I've got a goal for us here, um, but a lot of this is really healthy for you just in general. So pre-render, we want to do as much work ahead of time as we can. It's similar to what Kyle was talking about, how save battery, save other things. Do as much work in the build step as you can. And we'll go over a couple ways to do that. And we'll talk about why. We want to limit requests. So if you think back to our original goal, we're trying to optimize for first paint. And pre-render is a great way for the, the page as it's starting to load your HTML. So let's even think about that really quick. First page load. Index.html gets delivered. It starts scrubbing line by line. It goes, oh, title, icons, metadata, interesting. And then you can start writing preload uh, meta. And that will tell the browser, hey, I know you don't see any resources yet. You're only on line five of my HTML file. But I'm telling you, I'm going to need some stuff. And you might as well just start fetching it now, because I'm smarter than you. And you're just a crawler. And I'm an author. And listen to me, because I know. Anyway, so preload, that's not how I talk to my browser, but I suppose I would. It'd be kind of fun. And when you pre render, uh, you're limiting requests. You're going to empower preload, prefetch, cache, and even pre cache. Ooh, we're going to talk about pre cache. What does that mean? We're going to skip tombstones. So when you pre render and someone's launching your application, uh, if you're selling a client, I don't think they're really impressed by spinners and tombstones and all the clever ways that we can disguise how much time it takes to client-side load our application. And so when you pre-render and you do as much work on up front, you eliminate these things. And then again, it's one of those uncanny things that the client's not going to have to worry about. They're going to launch it. They're going to see the numbers tick up on the screen and be like, ooh, this is like a, a Bitcoin application. It looks so real. There's no spinners. It's so fast. Wow, hire this guy. Um, anyway. And uh, when we're pre-rendering here in our scenario, uh, and I used Jamstack, but we're pretty much on Rails. And what I mean by on Rails is the flow is in my control. And there's really only one or two flows to do. Oh, which I should have probably told you all what the flow was. Oh, you saw the GIF. Anyway, you can fake buy an Ethereum in my prototype. Um, Anyway, it's on Rails. And since it's on Rails, we know the entire flow, which means we can tell the browser everything it needs in order to do that flow on first load. First load goes and gets everything for the future. Super rad. Because our goal is to maintain an illusion. In this case, we're trying to sell someone on an idea, not sell them that we can build a production application. We're trying to get initial funding to go build the actual thing. The actual thing will be much more difficult than this on-rails prototype that we built. And you can use Jamstack to spa, uh, or Jamspa. It's my Dr. Evil. I made it up. I don't know if it's real. Uh, I mean, you can do it. You could pre-render as much as you can, bring in a framework. I guess it's Gatsby. Gatsby is kind of Jamspa. Anyway. Uh, and they're all valid experience creation options. Like, it doesn't matter how you pre-render, what framework you're using. The goal here is to just get as much uh, done ahead of time so that when it hits the browser, it can be instant. So that was pre-render. Uh, oh, that was pre-load. Uh, and now we're on bundle. Right? We all know we like bundled. Bundling is kind of like pre-render dependencies. So instead of me saying, you need this, 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 and this, I go, nah, I've done all that work. I've pre-bundled. I've taken it, and I've mashed it into this bundle, and I've compressed it, and I've, and I've obfuscated it so it looks all weird. And then I give it to the computer, and it goes, oh, yeah, bits. I know how to read these bits. And it, since it's in a bundle and it's all tight, it's really fast. So you want to pre-render, and you want to bundle. And uh, evaluate what you need to bundle. So depending on the complexity of your prototype, you may have zero to very little JavaScript. You might not need to bundle very much. Uh, or bundle at all. If you really have just a couple of JavaScript files that aren't big, you might be able to skip bundling, although it's usually a good idea. So if you're prepared and you like bundling, bundle. Then you should prioritize what should load first, what's most important for first paint. Because again, we want pixels on a screen as fast as possible, because when they click a link and that new page paints, we need it to be able to paint so fast, uh, and that means we have no blocking assets. So we've got to uh, prioritize what is critical and what is non-critical. And uh, so we're just basically deciding, since we know the story, we know the rails, uh, what needs to come before something else. And if you do have a lot of JavaScript dependencies, and this can be for any reason, you've got carousels, you've got some sort of robust data viz, um, chunk. And so if, you, if your bundle has grown too large and you're just kind of like walking around with this bundle and you're like, uh-oh, this is not going to go very well, uh, chunk it up. Deliver it in smaller pieces. And again, prioritize and decide what goes before the other so that when it loads, it has what it needs in the beginning, and you can lazy load after that. 
Also, consider differential serving. So this is in JavaScript land. This is pretty common. Uh, well, it's not common, but it's kind of up and coming, where you serve a type module that's all ES6, and you have another one that's all bundled and for old ES5 and, and beyond. Um, I also think that you can do this with CSS. So if you're getting really hardcore and you have a lot of assets in your prototype and things are getting really unwieldy, consider differential serving CSS, where you're saying, I'm going to deliver custom properties to this browser, and this other browser, I'm going to give it the fallback with variables. And that way you have a smaller bundle going to the browser that's ready for something that's optimized that way, and you have a larger bundle going to one that's not as prepared for that. So again, we're just, everything that we're doing, we're just squishing and tightening and shaving and cutting. Mm, it's fun. HTTPS. This is a native gateway. And what I mean by that is you have to have HTTPS in order to get access to the things that will make you look native. If you want to do web share, so that's sharing a link from your application that posts to another app that's ready to take it, geolocation, motion sensors, camera access, all of this stuff needs to be uh, served on an application that's on HTTPS. And if you put it on uh, Firebase or Netlify, you get HTTPS for free. And HTTPS is a PWA requirement. And that's not just a blocker to features, it's a requirement for promotion. Uh, and I think that's okay. I think it's okay to, to be required to be secure, right? You should want to be secure. Uh, and it's not, so it's, it's a dual. You get promoted in a PWA scenario. You get security. You get access to HTML5. You serve it over HTTPS. There's a lot of easy ways to get that done these days. Okay. So we're still, we're still like scrolling the top of the file. We've gathered the meta. We've done some uh, preloading. We've got all these bundles and assets. And now we have a preload, which is a really interesting thing. I, it's a declarative fetch directive. And this is you telling the browser, go ahead and fetch this. Uh, I'm going to need it very soon. And it looks like this. And preload is interesting because you cache the file as soon as possible. It goes and grabs it and says, ha-ha, I have preloaded this file. But it does not execute it. And that's kind of cool. And, the way that, and we can even use this later in some really clever ways. And so preloading, this is how you can preload styles, fonts, scripts, and images. If you have things that are really critical on your site, and you're trying to build a prototype that's instant and fast, you can preload all of your major critical assets this way. So this could be your, number, your top bundle, your top JS bundle and top CSS bundles, your custom fonts, the header image that's there. So when the page loads, there's no uh, request. It's already been requested, and it's ready to just inject. And that's what it means by no execution. Is you've cached it, and you're going to use it somewhere. And so as soon as you use it, the browser's already been grabbing it, and it might even have it just in its back pocket. And it's like, whoop, image. You told me to fetch it. It's like, cool, OK. And you don't delay the page's onload. So that's critical, right? Again, we don't want to block paint. We don't want to block the page. And preloading, it just kind of casually goes over it. It's like, oh, sweet, I'll preload this. Yeah, woohoo. Um, and so again, this is what we want. Oh, hi, little status bar. So it comes into other ways to not block. We can defer our assets. And the, again, no render blocking here. Our goal, we just no render blocking. Fetch these asynchronously or deferred. So deferred and async, they're ways of getting modules and getting JavaScript that says, um, just breeze over me. Go fetch me, execute me soon, um, but not yet. And don't block. So again, if, if, if you're not familiar, CSS and JavaScript will block as soon as they're discovered. If it finds a CSS file, it says, I can't, I can't move anymore. I have to go get the CSS and come back in order to continue. And it'll do that again when it hits your JavaScript file. But not if you do this. So my recommendation is to do stuff like this. You can take the script and say defer. You can say also, it's worth noting here that a type module script is deferred by default. It's not render blocking by default. Kind of cool, ES6, right? Why isn't that default all the time? And the, the little on line five and six, this is a cool hack to preload. So notice we're combining preload to get an asynchronous CSS file loaded. We're telling it, hey, fetch this, put it in your back pocket. But when you're done, secretly change this tag to a style sheet. And it goes, oh, it's a style sheet now? Oh, well, then I better go apply it to the page. And so that's how you get execution with preload. Very clever. So what's the difference between deferred and async? I think this is a common thing to be tripped up on. I just want to explain it really quick. Deferred is load asynchronously, right? Non-blocking, continue on. But when you're done, execute the files in the order you received them. 
And this is usually really critical with JavaScript because you've got the one below the above one is dependent on this one's successful loading. And you want to load asynchronously. You don't want to block the page. So it's going to go one, two, three, four, five. I've got five files to load. I'm going to keep going down the page. And then when it's done with them, it's going to execute them in order. And that's going to make sure that if you had a dependency chain, that dependency chain is maintained. Again, you can achieve that with the deferred uh, attribute on your scripts or just setting type equals module. And asynchronous is a little different. It will go grab each of those five files, but execute them as soon as they're done. And you don't control the source order. It just fires them as soon as they're ready. So this can be really handy if, you've got, uh, if you're trying to lazy load and things like that, and it's not dependent on the item before. So it might be good for chunks uh, other than or bundles. So that's async. And, and deferred, and then we have the asynchronous CSS trick, right? Load the CSS asynchronously and apply immediately. What a cool little trick. I'm a big fan. I think that was Scott Gell that did that. Follow him on Twitter. He's a clever, clever person. So service worker, all right, right? We can't talk about poise without talking about the service worker. Cash money, right? That's not very punny. I love puns, though. OK, so service worker, again, it's going to scrub all the files. At this point, we've pretty much gone down the entire HTML file, down to your bottom scripts, all of your JavaScript files that you've probably put at the bottom. They've been asynchronously or deferred their loading. And um, we're going to, at, the, at some point in those scripts, you're going to say, hey, I've got a service worker. Go ahead and fetch it and initialize it. And my service worker, I used uh, Workbox because it makes it really easy to cache things. And so this is a good example of how you can cache. Um, and so you want, again, you have a lot of static files because we pre-rendered, and our goal here is to go grab things in downtime. And as service workers, since it runs on a different thread, it's very good at just like doing a job while people are scrolling the home page. So when you loaded my prototype and you launched it, uh, as soon as you just waited one second, the browser goes, and it just starts grabbing all sorts of stuff because I told it to in the service worker, and it does that in a background thread nice and efficiently. You can also preload uh, and precache and do all sorts of things with your um, media files. This can be really nice too. As people hit subsequent pages, you've preloaded video, you've preloaded really expensive things, and they'll load instantly. And dynamic files, uh, a service worker is very good, and this is sort of their their primary value add, other than being off the main thread, is that they can cache dynamic files. I put the the emoji here like this. I don't know if I like good impression. Anyway, uh, because we were supposed to pre-render. So in our prototype, we're trying to do as much work ahead of time, and we shouldn't have a whole lot of dynamic caching happen. Usually with like dynamic files, that's where you hit a REST endpoint or you hit a, a GraphQL endpoint. You get some data back, and you want to cache that result. Uh, you can still do that if you want. So if your prototype has some dependencies on some external data that needs to be hot in the moment, yeah, you can do it. But if it doesn't need to be hot and you're just trying to tell a quick little story, then go grab a snapshot of that data the day before you show the presentation and skip this because this, um, I mean, it's great, but it's just another layer that you might have to manage. Another kind of cool thing the service workers can do, they can add a nice touch by sending you a push notification. Whoa, I have two minutes left? That's crazy. So we, can, uh, we also need to lazy load and optimize for first paint. We, we can lazy load based on time and events and hints. We have lazy candidates. So these are all the things in your page that are uncritical. These are nice to have glyphs. So like if you have a font that's really big, you can pull in the um, other parts of the font, like numbers and maybe special characters. Uh, interaction uh, required components, so lazy load things that needed interaction first. And third party elements. And some lazy tactics. So these are ways to lazy load things. You can go find a lib that will lazy load your images uh, with JavaScript and other things. You can also use ES6 dynamic import, which is super rad. And you can also use, also use attributes. We have this really rad uh, loading equals lazy coming to image in iframes. And that will uh, scan the image and uh, fetch it lazily. It's, it's, it gets rid of all the above requirements. Super awesome. And browser's very good at it. Paint holding just got announced by Chrome, and it's very cool. It's a Chromium freebie, as I said here. So you'll get this in your browser and in your Android browser. And we can see on the left, when someone clicks a link and a new page loads, a white background flashes before the new page loads. But on the right, with paint locking, it looks at the background color on your HTML and your body, and it persists it across the new page load, which gives us this very seamless uh, interaction. You don't even have to do anything to get this. You'll probably just get it for free sometime soon. And I wanted to point it out because it's really cool. Yeah, it's not critical. Ah, it's just nice. Fonts, I have a lot of tips and tricks here. 
Pretty much use the system font as much as you can because that's one of those uncanny things. If someone launches your app and it's Helvetica and they're used to um, the uh, San Francisco Sands, they're going to need that, um, they're going to feel that something's a little weird when they're looking at the, the fonts. Oh, this oh, doesn't look like my other native apps. And it's probably because you're not using the system font. So here's a sweet string that you can use that will help you use system fonts. And system fonts are interesting, interesting too because all the weights are already downloaded and all the variants, and you can just use them for free, and there's no loading cost. If you are going to do custom fonts, load them with preload and consider caching. Consider front loading them as much as possible. So we talked about that preload tag that says, hey, go fetch some stuff um, before. I know I'm going to need it. So that way, as the HTML file just starts getting read, it can go find your fonts and put them in cache and have them ready to execute when you, when you specify you need them in your CSS file. Variable fonts, this is a great way to compete with the native fonts because you can have one font to rule them all. There was a really great talk yesterday about variable fonts by Jason uh, Pomentel, or Pomentel, and you should go watch that. So we talked about lazy loading glyphs. This is a great way to save space. And CSS. OK, so there's uncanny things that happen when you add a poi to a home page. There's things that are really valuable when you're on a web page, but not valuable when you're in a native app. And so you can detect if someone has launched your application from the home screen with a media query. So you can set these adjustments to only be conditional if they're coming from an add to home screen scenario, which is nice. That way, if they're on the web page and they're not adding you to the home screen, they're going to get that experience that they want on the web. And what I mean by that is scroll views. So when you scroll, uh, you want to have the bounce, and you want to have the little uh, highlight as you hit the edges on Android. And the way that you get the bounce on iOS is WebKit overflow scrolling touch, though I think it's about to go away. And otherwise, you can use overflow scroll Y. And I think that's one of those uncanny things really quick that when you are you know, scrolling a page on your mobile phone and it doesn't have the bounce or, the, or, or things are bouncing with it, you start to get this sense like, ah, oh, this isn't the real table view that's in this application. Somebody's, something's wrong. You're like, oh, it's just uncanny to you. There's just a little something. What is it? And it could be this. Text selection. Uh, on the web, it's really nice to be able to highlight text. Native apps usually blow it away. And this is how you can do it in CSS. So you can put this code inside of that standalone media query, and that way no one can highlight text, which is going to be kind of nice if you're doing touch interactions. There's also tap highlights. So whenever you click something on a web page, it gives the tap highlight. You can blow that away with that line of code. So again, it gets rid of that uncanny scenario where they launch your app and they tap a button and they get this highlight. They're like, wait a sec. No native apps have that highlight. Why is that here? Callouts. So if you touch and hold on iOS, you often get some additional options on a web page. You can stop it like this. And hover and active. So these are kind of interesting. Back in the day, if you wanted to do hover and active like a press state in iOS, it was um, really difficult. They would be sticky, like your hover would be sticky. You can uh, eliminate that by on the body specifying untouched, on touch start. I also think this is a legacy solution, so you might not need it. I think CSS sticky is amazing, and it's a really great way to look native, because most people don't know that sticky is available on the web. And so when you build a prototype that has it, uh, people assume it's native. They think it's a native feature exclusively, and it's not. And it's rad. <laughs> Snap points is another one. If you ever built a carousel and you're swiping through the carousel and you're like, something is a little weird on this carousel. And it's probably because the inertia and the velocity and the way that it hits the edge isn't the same as the native platform. If you use CSS scroll snap points, all you have to do is write a little bit of CSS and they get native specific operating system scroll behavior. And that lets you surpass that uncanny valley. I love scroll snap points. And this is another critical one, is when you have images in this page, when you load the page and you want it to be instant and not jank, if you specify the height and width on your images, you can tell the browser that this is going to be this tall, and as it's drawing it, the first pass, it will include that height. Normally, though, it doesn't know the height, so it's collapsed until the image loads, and then it pops, and you get that jump. And so you can prevent the jank by just specifying a height on your images. This is also a good practice in general, which is kind of a lot of this stuff. Uh, Retina, this is another one. If you're uh, trying to be native, your images should be as high quality as possible. I'm going to kind of just uh, skip over this a little bit, but here's the picture element. And this lets you handle many Retina scenarios in one element. And this is amazing. As you can see, you can specify WebP at 2x and 1x, and you can do PNG and loading lazy. And the way that this works is it will find the one based on the source set match, and it will put that source into the source of the image tag, and the image tag will kick off loading lazy. It's a really cool freebie. So gotchas with uh, um, Retina is, again, you're going to be managing a whole bunch of images. You might feel a lot of debt. Automate it as much as you can. Pull to refresh. 
uh, Android has this by default, and so when you load a PWA from a home screen and you're pulling down and you get the, the Chrome browser live or the, the refresh, it can ruin the illusion and you can get rid of it just like that. You say over scroll behavior Y contain, and that will make it so that your scroll doesn't, uh, the event doesn't bubble out of the container, which is super rad. But you still get the glow, which is kind of cool iOS links, for 10 years we've had this issue where if you click a link inside of an added to home screen application, that it would open up Safari, uh, and it was ugly, and it would open up Safari like in the app, it, just, oh, it broke everything about the illusion, and this will be a huge gotcha if you ever try to do it, and here is my trick. This is a crazy trick. I really, really want to point out that start URL as slash index.html is not just the root of my page. For some reason, that is magical. And when you have it, if you change it to anything else so far in my testing, you don't get the links opened up in the app. And then you have to use JavaScript to intercept every link and set location equal to the location href. It's ugly. If you use start URL index.html, you'll notice if you launch from the iOS home screen, all the links stayed in the app. It was instant and snappy, and it's because of that one line in the manifest. So I didn't know that iOS used the manifest very much, but it does. And it, I don't think it uses very much else other than that start URL. So I need to do more research, but I know that that has been saving my bacon. Offline UX, I'm just going to skip over this one. This is a way to show off, uh, because if you have it, um, it's a good way to look native. If you can handle the offline state, it's a great way for your prototype to look a little bit more uh, native. So that was 18 steps to a seamless prototype. Here they all are on one little list. Right? We had a manifest, we went through all the icons, we made sure we served everything without blocking the paint. And that's what makes it so that when you click each of those links, you get a, a paint on a new page that's under uh, 30 milliseconds, and it looks as fast as a single page application, but it's really pages. It's new index pages, every tap in my uh, prototype here. So these are all ideas and tips for he building healthy apps across the internet. I made them specifically tailored so that you could go sell your idea and get money and, and user test and, and really fake people out that you've built something much better than you have. I hope that was entertaining and good. Thanks, y'all.